Let us go ahead and get ourselves started. <laughs> hmm. Maybe a little adjustment here first. Hang on, over there. Back over here. Okay, that's better. And talk about what we are going to cover today in session 10 of 120C, 220C. Today we're going to continue thinking about evaluating things, all sorts of things about what we can evaluate. We're going to do some evaluation relative to the sun, continue with that thread, and start thinking about how we can not only go through and compute some different values based upon how the sun is hitting us, but actually start to adapt our geometry so that it's following the sun, so that we can do things so that it's responding appropriately to the sun, whether it's adding additional shading or sort of reorienting ourselves so that we can try to pick up more sun's energy. Um, if we're trying to collect some solar energy, something like that. It's really how we can sort of adapt our elements to use the sun vector for the addition of computing numerically. Towards the end, I think we're probably also going to give an example of a little design advisor where we'll kind of take a look at a building and based on the rooms can be a little kind of color feedback about how you're doing relative to some design criteria. But relative to, oh, just thinking about a recap of what we were looking at, we spent some time just looking at filtering and using uh, different conditions to go through and control whether or not uh, things were either regenerated or whether they appeared or were acted upon. And the Boolean mask turned out to be a great way of doing some of that. Then we head down a path of really trying to say, could we use the notion of a vector that points to the sun and a cross product? So a vector, uh, dot product, excuse me, of uh, basically that vector and a vector normal to a surface to figure out just how direct we were and get some numeric values out of that. And for the most part, that kind of worked OK. There was a little variation in the whole scheme we had to worry about in that when Revit is going through and computing normal surfaces, it doesn't always do it in the direction you think. Uh, and you have to sort of watch out for that a little bit. Um, it's a little hard to predict exactly what the pattern is, but we have a way of compensating for that where we always flip vectors or we test vectors to think at the point we are, whether they're pointing in the direction we think they are or not, and then adapting them based upon whether they are. Okay. We will move into kind of continuing with that, but I want to go ahead and get to start thinking about assignment two. We'll go ahead and send out something this weekend that talks about just really what's going to go on. It'll be one where you have another week to work on it, something like that. But it's going to be, as you might imagine, based on what we have been doing lately, based on the whole notion of creating a parametric object, but then going through and adapting it so it does something in response to the sun. And we'll look at some examples today of how it, we could be adapting the panelization kind of adding color or changing something about the uh, parameters of the panel, changing the size of an opening, adding a feature to the panel to sort of make a difference between where it's a very shady location or where it's a sunny location. Okay. Um, so it's going to be based on yeah, just kind of taking something and either changing something parametrically about the panelization or even the geometry itself, sort of adapting the geometry so that you know, it is either trying to face or be perpendicular to the sun. So you're doing something so that its shape is smartly deforming and it based upon what you want to do. And an example of what to think about, I thought about this relative to actually Claire, your assignment, because I think it's actually sort of an interesting one. Um, Claire has sort of what we call the flying pie <laughs> wedge, pie top, something like that. Kind of a very curvaceous canopy that's kind of ripples like a sine wave or something like that. And there's sort of an interesting thing as you start thinking about the sun in something like that that has a lot of ripples. We can start to control basically the degree of ripple or the amplitude of the ripple to try and maximize how the different waves catch the sun. And we can sort of evaluate how the different panels are when it's a relatively flat ripple or it's versus a relatively steep ripple and try to figure out really what is the optimum orientation. That'll change a little bit. It'll be a little bit different for every location on the Earth because it'll depend on uh, the latitude and really how the sun's hitting. It could change a little bit based on the time of year, whether we want to be catching the sun during the wintertime or during the summertime. There's a lot of things that could be happening in there. So we're going to start taking your parametric objects and trying to apply just a little bit of math and geometry to exercise the parametric capabilities in a way that kind of gives a desired behavior. 
So as you think ahead of that, you know, you could be using your existing parametric doctrine or thinking about a different one, but think about something that could have an interesting behavior relative to the sun, for example. Okay, something you'll design based on that. Okay, I'll send out some examples and some guidance about that, but just kind of file that one away. Okay, let's go ahead and think about where we want to go today. First thing I want to do is really just pick up that whole thread of just um, doing those evaluations of the panel directness relative to the sun, and really follow it up with really two very simple examples. We sort of actually dug it in the first one, 10.1, <coughs> mapping the panel color okay, to orientation strength. And we'll do something else where we map the panel parameters to it. But they're both very simple. I think it'll be a very direct follow on from where we were last time. So if you want to go ahead and open up 10.1, we'll just kind of add a little nuance to the equation. So, I'm going to go off and let's see if you can get them. I think they're all out there. Close this up for me right now. Just open up 10.1. 10.1 you'll see is actually very similar to where we left it last time. I just went through and added a little more annotation to it all. But we'll map our panel color based on the orientation of the sun. You'll see I have something that looks kind of like a blue to red sort of spread right now. If I zoom on out a little bit here, I'll say Zio, Zio, you'll see there's the sun. It's kind of hanging in the sky. Um, if I move the sun and rerun the Dynamo script, theoretically, we should sort of see the red area versus the blue area kind of shifting around a little bit because all those panels are being reoriented or reevaluated all the time. Okay. It's also, of course, sensitive to what time of year it is. Right now, this is June 10th. But if I go through and switch to December, the sun will be much lower in the sky. So again, the panels will look a little bit different then, at least in terms of colorization. So if I go through here and say, oh, I'm going to change that to December instead, we could do something like that. Um, we could also go through and change the time of day. So the interesting thing about this example, or the limitation I should sort of comment about this whole example as we go through and do this is, you know, it really is based on sort of this notion of a snapshot in time. Oops, I just sort of shifted it to late at night, and that's not a very good thing. I'm going to change it to sort of 10 in the morning. So if we go through and we rerun this, it'll uh, hopefully go through and adapt it. Yeah. An interesting thing about the, the way doing these snapshots in time is it's really kind of a very isolated view of the world. It's just sort of at that particular time that the directness of the sun is. So there's inherently sort of a, a weakness to this approach, but we'll soon compensate for it. But this approach is really based on that single point in the geometry at that point in time. Just to kind of preview where we are going, though, we're going to start thinking about it not being so much at a point in time, but actually thinking about the whole range of times throughout the year and throughout different times of the day. Okay, but we'll need a little more uh, analysis capability to do that. We'll go through it actually need more something called a solar radiation plug-in, which would then give us the solar values on those different surfaces across either a season or the entire year or range of times. But for right now, just snapshotting sort of illustrates the principle. Okay, and as people think about doing specific snapshots, the ones that always seem to grab their attention in terms of being interesting positions are either at the winter solstice or the summer solstice. So people tend to like either December 20th or June 20th or 21st as being really good dates in terms of uh, just either understanding where the sun is highest in the sky or lowest in the sky. Okay. But we'll hang out there. Okay, so if you have this open, let's go ahead and take a look at the dynamo behind it all. This will look very familiar to where we were last time. I'll say open and go on out there and I'll just get the 1A so we can hook it all together. Okay. 
this should look fairly familiar to like where we were last time. And basically, I just sort of broken it into some little uh, color blocks to make it a little bit easier to follow. Yeah. Uh, what's going on here? So in my Groovy, let me kind of pull on over here. Just kind of show that, oh, the way I think about it, it looks something like this. I basically pull out all my input parameters, both the number of rows and the number of columns, sort of the face that I'm going to apply them to, and the panel, sort of put them all on a single block to make it easy to follow. I'm going to use this adaptive panels on surface custom node to go through and create those panels. And basically making those 10 by 14 panels. Again, that custom node just has some logic that we stashed away. If you want to take a look at that logic, you can again say just edit the node and sort of see what's going on in there. But it's that same sort of logic we've been applying where we go through and make a grid, we put points on those uh, parameters on those grid locations, we flatten the list, quad it, flatten that list, and then finally apply the adaptive components to it. Okay, so that hopefully looks pretty familiar. But the idea is if you can stash that away as something that you're gonna keep on using, go for it. Okay, so if we go through and run this so far, the idea is we should get either a whole bunch of adaptive components or a whole bunch of points. Okay, it's running right now, completed with some warnings. That's okay, I think there's some stuff going on over down on that end. That's not quite complete yet. But you see I have a bunch of seamless panels, or I have a bunch of quad points here. <coughs> We want to go through and pull that into sort of a node that we should evaluate our panel orientation relative to the sun. So let's talk about what's in here. This is a node where I really just grabbed a lot of the stuff that we've been doing and put it into a single node. If you say edit that custom node, it has basically two main chunks to it. We're going to grab some points as an input and we're going to basically um, just compute a vector to the sun. So based upon those quad points coming on in there, that's an input and the sun settings. The sun settings being the place where the sun is in your current Revit model. Okay. Go through and put a plane that fits to those points, create a normal, take the sun, do the normal to the sun, and then ultimately do a dot plot between the two. And that's going to give us this range of values anywhere from negative one to positive one. Okay. What we needed to do is just go through and do a little remap on it from 0 to 1. Okay. And that's giving us the sun directness values. Although we did do a slight variation on this. So I went through and tried to change the vectors right here in terms of saying, hey, if the vectors were pointing downward as opposed to upward, uh, go through and flip them around so they're pointing in the same direction. So that one in turn is a custom node. And if you open that one up, looks like this. So it just takes a plane vector, breaks it in the x, y, z components. If z is less than 0, just multiplies the components by minus 1. And the true basically evaluates if it was less than 0, go ahead and use the flipped components. If it wasn't less than 0, then just use the same components that came in. But this whole notion of these nodes that fit inside of nodes that fit inside of other nodes becomes a really useful way of working with this because I can take my evaluate panel directness to the sun and give it to you or anyone around the world and they could give it a set of points and uh, a sun location, you know, get my evaluation. You know, someone else give you a much better evaluation. Or you might even imagine in the future as we're working, rather than just doing this dot plot, if I did something much smarter here in the pink zone, to go through and find the cumulative sun values as opposed to just this dot plot, we could fill that in there instead. And because it's all being encapsulated, it's very efficient. And that is, you make any change in the system, the other things don't need to change. You just kind of, you know, 
get it encapsulated. Another advantage of that is that if you tend to use the same nodes in a lot of different graphs, if you update them and change them in one place, they're updating and changing in all the different uses of that. So it tends to be a very nice, efficient way to operate. So the idea is back over here, I have my points. This thing over here is basically looking for some quad points. So all I have to do is pull in my quad points and the current sum. And that should give me that range of values. So I'll grab those points, put them in here. People sometimes wonder about whether I should pull off the watch or I should just pull directly off the points. And the truth is, it doesn't really matter. Watches are really null. They don't change anything. They just make things visible. Sometimes eventually I close the watches to get rid of the watches. So I tend to go back to the original as opposed to going off the watch, just because if I happen to delete the watch later, I don't want to sort of you know, kill anything downstream. Okay. So if I go through and run this based upon these points, I hopefully will get that big range of values. Let's give it a try. Again, this is one. I'm expecting them all to be between 0 and 1. Oops. Yeah, because within there, I'm doing the rescaling. We'll see if it actually is between 0 and 1, because I think it's clear to notice there's a couple of them that may be just a little funky based on the notion of upward. So we might want to use a different notion called outward instead to help us decide on the values. OK, so what do I got hanging around over here? So I got all sorts of numbers in here. They're floating around anywhere from 0, 0 0.26, 0.48, all sorts of numbers in here. Okay, Looks like there's some sort of scale range of numbers in here. What I'm going to do is take it over to this thing that maps to the color range. So for the color range, let's kind of come popping over here. This was the basic logic we were working on last time. The idea is, I am going to go through and just based on a value of 0 to 1, map up some colors. And what I need to do for color range is create both a list of colors and a list of indices, which are the values associated with each of those colors. That makes sense. So I have two different colors here, red 255 and blue 255. I'll put them together in my little list of colors. I will take that list of colors down to here as the list of colors. These are the values that are associated with it. Again, 0 to 1. So that's just sort of saying where the extremes are in that range. I'll pull that over. Okay. And now what I should be able to do is pull my values over and get a whole bunch of different color values. So you see I have my little red-blue range. OK, so this little block of code, it's, you know, again, you might have been sort of a useful thing to keep hanging around, because we're going to do a lot of color mapping. If you would, for example, prefer to see things mapped to the red-green range, you can go ahead and try that. I just pull to green as opposed to blue, okay, and run that. You'll see I'll be red to green on my range. If you per prefer oh, red to yellow, for example, how do you get yellow in a red, green, blue, green, blue world? Red, green, specifically. Red and green added together give you yellow. But you're, you're right, any <laughs> values you want in there would work. Who knew? OK, in the same sense, if you happen to like purple, Go red and blue. Okay, that's a kind of a cyan color, or not a, a magenta color. Excuse me. Blue is kind of funny as a cyan color. What happens if you do red, green, and blue? Light. <laughs> Who knew? <laughs> it's like, okay, so you get yeah any sort of variation you want in there. Let's try something a little bit different. What if I actually want the three colors? Why not? 
<laughs> what kind of magic are you talking about here? <laughs> this is heresy. You can't do that. Okay, so we'll take that. Put another one in here. Oh, maybe I'll just put the uh, green and a yellow in the middle. Okay, here's the deal. I'm going to make a list there. And oh, if I want to put white on the end and yellow in the middle, I'll do it that way. Okay. But what we need to do is come up with a list of values that sort of has the same, but for each of those items in the list, that basically say what value you're mapping it to. So in that case, maybe it's 0, 0 0.5, 1. Try that. So you can really you can have a whole rainbow stack if you want to. So color is pretty easy to go through and mess around with. So we could go ahead and let's kind of do this a couple of different ways because I can imagine a couple of different nodes that might be useful. This whole thing here, you know, all we're doing now is we're going to pull those color values out and let's take them over here. What do I do with them? Where's my color over right in view? If I don't have it, I'll put it back in there. Well, there it is. It's hang okay, it's hanging around somewhere. It's way up there. So, in terms of my element co color over right in view, I'll take my colors on up. I'm going to grab the list of elements, not the list of points. So. If I'm doing what I just said I would do a couple minutes ago, I'm going to grab the adaptive components and pull them across. And we'll rerun that. Let's take a look over here. Should we delete it? The first thing before we start? Yeah. Ah. Try this again. Because if they're on top of each other, that's not going to work. Although I'm looking and I'm not seeing much action here, so let's see if I can figure this out. That says null right now. That can never be a good thing. Let's see if I can figure this out. I got a list of colors over here. Let's see what I got over here. Null is never a good thing. So let's figure out what's going on over here. I got my list of colors. Maybe I'll do a little watch action. See what's going on with those colors, because I sort of expect I'm getting some colors out here, but maybe not. Let us try that. Okay. You're looking like a list of colors, so let us think about this. I got a list of colors here. What's going on down here? I have a bunch of colors here. I have a bunch of colors there. What is not going on here with my element override color in view? Because I got colors and I got a lot of values. My intuition says this should be working. But let's see what's going on. Is it, is it working for anyone or is it all failing for everyone? Not working. Let's figure out if we can sort of at least figure out, figure out a mapping in terms of what happened here. If I look back over here in terms of the panels, I'm going everywhere from 0 to 100 and looks like 19. Or no, hang on. It's 100. And And 40. Okay, or 139. If I come back over here, also 140. That's not it. So we got the colors. Okay, what's going on here? Hmm. Well, let us simplify because the colors seem to be there. That's kind of okay. Element, override color view, those color values, not that. That should be fine.
I'm going to do a pull in the note again on the theory that something might be broken. This is the stuff that's supposed to just work. So again, I'll take the elements over. I'll take this color list over. Let's try writing that. There's null again. Boy, is that annoying to me, because it shouldn't be. I'm not in a family. I'm in a project. OK, let's try simplifying back in terms of what's going on over here. Oh, if I switch that back to just two colors again. Again, that, I don't, can't think of why that would matter, but we'll see. And I'll come back over here and take that down. So it's just the two colors. Let's try running that. So I got this to work by re-selecting my surface. Ah, yes. that's entirely possible. OK, so let's try that. So what you did was came back over here and just reselected the surface? Yeah, it's a mass, so it might be hit by default. Okay. I actually sort of make it, I think it's a mass that's sort of transparent, which I. So I had to, I had to change my view settings and mass and so. Let's see if I can get this. What's going on here? there. Oh, so the mass really is hidden there. Interesting. Okay. Ba, 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 ba. Mass. Show mass. Hey. Okay. Got another mass hanging around in there too. Again, so I got that, I will run it. Let's see what's going on over here. It says run completed, but it looks like it's still flashing around on me. That looks better. Now I have a bunch of seamless panels, and if I come back over here, I bet they are colorized. That's a little better looking. Okay, so looks like I had to reselect my mass. Okay. Going everywhere for that yellow overtone red right now. We can again sort of change different things about that. But what I want to sort of you know, uh, talk about relative to that little node right here. Is the, just how we can actually go through and use this. This is now, I guess that's the second color there. We'll remove that one. Put that one back over here. Glenn, yes. I'm getting an error. Let's check it out. Okay, so you got uh, okay, 41, not matching. Let's think about this. It's three values there, it's three values there. And the values over here, 0, 0, 0.5 and 1. Yeah, my fabulous cube. It should be three colors, it should be that. And it's just not doing that. Hmm. Yeah, it says run started. Like it thinks it's in the middle of doing something. Like it's trying to recompute. How about this? Yeah. Why don't you go ahead and take out the color range node, and we're going to put it back in again. So oh, maybe. Remove that. Oh, right. Now go ahead and see if we can grab color range again. Okay. Pop that in, and again we'll take your list of three colors. 
And we'll take your list of three values. And up to indices. Yeah. Uh -huh. the indices. I have it as well. And then the values will be um, these sun yeah, values put in there. Okay. Let's try that and then we'll take that over to um, the colors that you want to run. Beautiful. Let's see if that'll run for you. It's weird, just Dynamo gets fussy sometimes and I try taking out nodes and putting them in when they don't behave. Or that was a good cut to Andrew in terms of that, yeah, we just need to go back and reselect the surface. Okay, great. I think it has done it. Now though, what's going on? Go but let's go back over. Selected the surface again. Okay. Oh, okay, it thinks it's in the middle of something right now. Run started. So let's go ahead and, yeah, turn that off again. And then if go over to the part where you override the color and view, and I think that's probably null right now. Let's go ahead and take a look at that. It's like, yeah, it's just in the middle of doing something right now. Okay, so let's go back to Revit in the background. Okay, and we will uh, do a little under massing in sight. We will say, let's show the mass. Or one, it's the one that looks like a, there it is. Very good, okay, now it's there. So now we should be able to go into Dynamo and choose the select face. It looks like it thinks it's in the middle of doing it already. So what you might need to do is just close Dynamo and bring it back open again or something like that. I think it's just, got it. Yeah, there's a little bit of a mess just hanging around there. Let's see if we can get you going. And then what I want to show, just in terms of where you can go with all this, is that if you have a fantastic block of code, which is looking like uh, you know, it's just ready to do something good for you, it might be repurposable, what you can do is go ahead and grab that code and save it as your own custom node. For example, I now have something that's mapping on a red-yellow range. So I'm going to go through and just change that to say yellow in there. But if that is something that we would actually like to repurpose and use again, share with all your friends, what you can do is just think about the nodes which are actually involved. In this case, the input is really just some values, any set of values from 0 to 1. Okay, the output is a list of colors that is sort of matched those different values. So if you want to, Go ahead and grab that, just the part that's the part you might want to encapsulate. And you could say, oh, it's not there. I always mess that up. It's under the Edit menu. Create a node from the selection. And if you create a node from the selection, what it's going to do is let you go through and give it a name and save it off somewhere. So what happened here? It's working. Excellent. Woohoo! It just closed it. Oh, no, right. it's my friend Dynamo is like really fussy sometimes. Yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna say, let's create a node from that selection. This node wants a name, and what am I gonna do? I'm gonna call this kind of color, okay, uh, map values, um, kind of red to yellow. I'm gonna give it a category just so it shows up in my browser somewhere. I actually put them under 120. I have now noticed that all that chunk of code has been replaced just by a single node that has a single input for values, has a single output for colors, okay, which is not too bad. So I can now, if I want to, edit that custom node, see what's going on. It's not looking too off the bed. Okay. Why I'm going through and editing it though, what I usually like to do in terms of editing it, because this is going to be perfectly, perfectly repurposable. This one actually is red to yellow, just because red and yellow are sort of color coded in there. You know, you could, although it wouldn't give you much of an advantage, say that you want to map it to like, you know, two different input values, so that would sort of be the same as that function. So you wouldn't get much out of that. 
But let's take this. I want to save this away. And here's what I want to do. Yeah, I don't want to save it just in the default location because, of course, you don't come back to your machine. You might miss it. So instead, do a little save as and put it somewhere useful to you. For example, put it in the folder that has this Dynamo example in it because then you can go through and have um, all your little uh, custom nodes in there. You'll see already I have a uh, color map values to red blue range. I have an evaluate panel orientation to the sun. I have my little adaptive panels on surface. I tend to kind of keep those just local, okay? Just because I move around quite a bit. If you have a new project that you need to use those in, yeah. do you copy them into yeah. that new folder? Around and copy. And as, as long as, the, the only rule of thumb is um, when people open your project, when the Dynamo graph opens, it has to be able to find these. If it doesn't find these, they show up in red, I think it is. It was missing in action. Okay, so let's go ahead and save that away. So I got two different nodes. So I have my map red to yellow. I have another one that I put out there, just because I created it a little bit earlier this morning. If you want to open up the red to blue, you can put that one in there instead. You can like, uh, they're both available. So if I say open, and I go to map the red blue range, okay, you'll see it'll show up here also. Actually, I just opened it right there. So what I'm gonna do is come back over here. That's red to yellow, oops. That's red to blue, so just depending on what I want. You can go through and kind of create different custom nodes. And custom nodes are going to be your friends. I yes? don't understand the categories of C with How is that in all of the machines? <laughs> I'll say it again. How is it in one? How is the category CE with 20 in just like a category on the machine? Oh, it's really just everything, all the different nodes just have basically some category they belong to. So if you created something that has the category CE120 and it's loaded, okay, it'll put it over there in the browser. So, so it's there because I created it last session. Or in this case, it, it, it could be there because it was saved from last session if it was in the default location. Or okay. because it's referencing the nodes that are categorized. In this current graph, if you open one, like because I opened, if, if I went to one that didn't have that in there and I opened it, it would then, as soon as I opened it and there was something that belonged to 120, 120 would show up over there. Okay. So it's really kind of a very interesting informal scheme. Most people sort of put the, they create a category sort of based on, oh, like their own kind of group of things like Build Z is like Zach Cron, who does a lot of these. Lunchbox is another kind of collection of them. It's just a way of publicizing and putting your stuff out there. So each developer is going to have their own like, category yeah. for all their like, different things. Generally, they do it that way. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah
Okay, so creating custom nodes, uh, color ranges, sort of feeling okay? Okay, let's go ahead and give it a slight variation on that theme, because if you can get those and make color nodes out of them, you can just as easily take those values and basically set some panel parameters. So here's the deal. We're just going to go through and based on the panel, look at what parameters it has available to us. So different ones, there's one, there's a rectangular panel with an opening, it wants a scale between, oh, like, you know, less from zero to 0.5, but we don't want it to be at zero. Okay, uh, in terms of the size of an opening, we have um, the aperture panel. The aperture panel has this thing called the width of the uh, kind of bars that are in that aperture. But we're basically going to choose what panel parameters we want to change. We're going to have to come up with some sort of scaling. Okay, The scaling is just going to be something based on, if we know we have values from 0 to 1, we have to remap them into a range that's going to make sense for whatever it's expecting here. And then finally, we're going to say, let us, as supposed to getting the parameters by name, we're going to set the parameters by name. So we created a bunch of panels, we created a name, we created the scale values, and it kind of does what it's supposed to. So, that's the, the overview. Does that kind of make sense as a roadmap? It all sounds so logical when you sort of hear the roadmap and then somehow you get lost in the nodes that don't work the way you want. Okay, but let's go ahead and give it a try. If you go out to, oh, where did it go? 10.2. I'm going to close this up. That's actually kind of nice. Actually, if you still have it open, try moving the sun around and recomputing it. It's actually kind of cool to see. <laughs> okay, I'm going to open up old 10.2. 10.2 is going to look so familiar. You're going to say, why is he doing this? Because it looks like something you've already seen. But it has a slight variation to it. as you watch it. It's almost like it's building up one icon in the bar at a time. It's just a lot, a lot of flashing as it goes through. Okay, so here we have a different sort of scheme here. I have applied some colors. You can sort of see red to blue in terms of how the sun is uh, applying to all this. If you go through and look at these different aperture panels, and these aperture panels are always strung out quite big right now. Maybe I'll kind of change it so there's more panels going across. But you'll see that they have a parameter value to them called wall thickness. And wall thickness can go everywhere from 1 to, let me flip it over to the other side. Take a look at them being a little bit bigger on this side. There, that's set to almost 5 feet. We can really choose whatever scale we want to. But where we're going with this is we're going to take those same values, those same sun directness values, and just go through and change that parameter value based on that. Okay. So if you're willing to go down that path with me, go ahead and delete those. <laughs> Although, per Andrew's discovery, it might make sense for us to go through and uh, just reselect the surface. What I'm going to do, even for this, I'm going to filter. I'm going to make sure I don't take out the mass. So I'm going to need that mass in a minute. How did you do that? Okay, so after you go through and select, oh. then you uh, there's this little filter button. It's interesting. Why is that? Is it, is, this might be turned off. No, it shouldn't be automatic. It's trying to do something. Okay, so I'm going to say filter. Turn off the mass. I want to delete all those. There we go. So now I just have my little surface there. Okay, in this case, the mass is visible. I actually turned mass on using visibility graphics and made it sort of transparent, which is actually not a bad thing to do. To do that, if you want to play along, you say VG for visibility graphics. 
And then down in the mass category, there's this you know, override that you can apply for transparency. I sometimes do that because it's kind of nice to see the mass, but really transparent because you like to see the curvature underneath it all. So that's just got a tricky Yes? Okay, let's try it again. So grab it, go filter, turn off the mass, say okay. Apply. Oh, maybe I have to do that. Oh no, but oh, you still have to delete. I'm sorry. So delete the mass. Oh, okay. So go back again. Okay, so grab them all, including the mass. Okay, say filter. Okay, turn off the mass. Okay. Then say apply. And then it'll only select the uh, panel. Oh, then got it. <laughs> Okay, you got it? Selects it. And then I thought it was going to be selecting everything. <laughs> Second row looking good. Why is mine yellow? Why is it yellow? I don't know. It looks like the surface might still be there. If you select it, what's happening? It's in there. It might be. Is the shading turned on? Is that just the surface? Go and grab. Do a little hover over the whole thing. It looks like there's still something there. I haven't been there. I think it'll go all the way around the outside. so that you uh, don't grab the mask too. So, so select first. Select everything, excellent. Now filter, under modify, filter. Okay, go ahead and check none, or just turn on the curtain panels is the only thing we want to delete. Excellent, say so, okay. Okay, now hit the delete. Oh, you. Choose the curtain panel, say OK, and now delete that. Woo! OK, looking good. Looking good. OK, so this one will look amazingly familiar as we start getting into this. OK, if you open up the ever popular, oh, is it 10.2A? I think it probably is. Little Dynamo. Go for 10 to A. Thanks. Okay. 10 to A. Okay. This should look very familiar, because it is. Except for, well, we might want to do that to sort of select the faces just to be on the safe side. If you want to do that just to be on the safe side, go ahead and click that, select the face, right in here, change that, come back over to Revit, select that face just to make sure. Okay, so over here on the left hand side, nothing's changing. We're going through and panelizing. Although I did decide, let's see what I got over here. It's only three wide in that direction. That three wide is really looking kind of, uh, you know, chunky. So I'm going to make that five wide or something like that. Okay, five panels in that direction. Let's take a look over here. We're going to panelize them. We're going to evaluate the panel orientation of the sun. Phew, don't have to worry about that node. It exists. It's over there. Hopefully we've debugged it. Okay, it's hanging around. So we're going to come on over and start by just, we're going to use that, ooh, check this out, map color, red to blue. Okay, super. So if I just run this one, theoretically everything's going to look kind of okay over here. In terms of, let's take a look at which panel we're actually applying though, just to be on the safe side. Go back over there to my green zone. I'm going to go for the aperture panel. That's the one that has like the crossbar. Okay, so let's give that a run just to see. 
That'll compute some var or values for us. Got on in the background there. Got a whole bunch of aperture panels. They got some color applied to them. That's looking pretty good. The only sort of problem I'm seeing so far is that these aperture panels, like uh, they're all have the same parameters. Nothing changed about them. Just the color is overridden. So let's think about how we can change the parameters. So here's the deal. As I go back and look at this panel directness to the sun, you might remember I'm getting a bunch of values here that are going anywhere from 0 to 1. Okay. So what I want to do is take 0 to 1 and map it into another range, like 1 to 5 or 1 to 10 or something like that, which is going to be the range of values that I want to see in the thicknesses. So what I need to do is just come on over. And we're going to start with just doing a little remapping. So I've got a bunch of 0 to 1s. I want to map them into a new range. I can choose what I want the new minimum and the new max to be. Actually, that's kind of funny. My brain just sort of backwards there. The min should be one. I think the min should probably be 1. <laughs> I'm just guessing. Although I'm kind of curious about if it does, if it, it's sort of interesting if it'll flip a, if it'll flip a list that way. I don't know. We'll see. Okay. But what I want to see now is I'll just go ahead and run this and see, am I getting, instead of 0 to 1, am I getting a bunch of numbers between 1 and 5? So give that a run. It does work backwards. Does it flip them in the other orientation? Yeah. So in this scheme, that's a value of 2. You say if I flip them, it'll actually work? It'll be different. It'll be closer to 5. Yeah, it works in the way. Intriguing. So I think it's just sort of, it's still doing the mapping, but it's sort of, you know, it's doing that funny flip. You can decide which one you want to go. Does okay. it keep it, it just scales them like into a bigger range, so if the range is bigger, yeah. then it's, it's just like it's proportionally. It's, exactly, it's a linear scale. Okay, so we want to go from the minimum value, so in this case, I guess the minimum value is close to zero, it's getting mapped into something close to five, and the highest value, which is close to 1, is being mapped back to 1. So it's so really whether you want to invert it or not. Okay. So I have some numbers there. You can decide which way you want to do the scaling. I'm going to change it around a little bit. I'm going to say, great, I got some numbers. Let's go through and take the elements, okay, and these numbers, and map these numbers to the parameter wall thickness. Okay, so I'll take these numbers, take the that parameter name. I still need to give it some elements to work with. So I'll go back over, and again, the better way is to actually grab the components. I could grab the watch. Okay, pop that over here. Let's run this. Sort of see. So the direction of where you map the zero and where you map the one is really going to determine just you know where which are the thicker and which are the thinner elements. By mapping it this way. The closer to zero, which is the less direct to the sun, is actually getting a very low value, so the wall thickness is low. You get a lot of opening. Whereas if I flip over to the sunny side of the street, over there, okay, 
It's getting thicker where the sun is stronger. Well, I gave it the red to blue. I mean. Oh, but it could be where my but sun I is. I think the sun is blue. Okay, let's check it out. It's entirely possible I got that backwards. Let's go back out here, sort of see what's happening. So I'm over here. Let me say zoom out a little. All right. I got it there. So here, I got this sort of, it's almost inverted the way I want it. Although it's the same thing, and let's kind of pop it up a little bit higher. So you just switch in the custom node, the input? You could. It worked. Okay, let's try this. So that's 10. Let's go ahead and run that up again. Again, let's make sure we have the right sense. We know we're getting something about the directness, okay? Actually, even for that, I should flip it over to the other side to sort of see it stronger. But, you know, in terms of the colorization, in terms of the red and blue and the blue to red, we might have to flip that around. Okay, it's doing what we're computing right now. And also the thickness, we don't want to switch that around. Okay, so clearly here, it is backwards on the colorization. So I'm seeing the sunny side in terms of what's going on there. So let's go ahead and fix some of those things because that's not the behavior I want. In terms of the mapping of the color, I can go through and just change the order because what's this going? This is giving me basically the reds. Ah, here's what it is. Notice that the red is coming in at the zero value, the, one, the blue is coming in at the one value, because the first one in the list, the second one in the list. So if I just flip the order of those two things in the list, yeah, it's basically saying, if you give me a value of zero right now, map it to pure red, and you give me a value of one, map it to pure blue. So I just need to flip the order of those two things to really make this work right. If I want red to be close to one and blue to be close to uh, zero. Screen. What's that? Screen red off. Okay. Okay, so I'm just flipping which color is associated with each end of the, ra end of the range. Do you get that in terms of these indices and zero and one, how those are the ends of the range? That's where the value is going to map towards. And then, you know, whatever's at the front and whatever's at the back end. Okay, so this should now, let's go ahead and save that away. Flip the color in terms of the way we want it. We also have the whole issue of the thickness. Let's think about this. If I said that it was close to zero, do I want the... The way it is right now, 5 is the minimum, 1 is the top. So the values close to 1 are getting very thin bars. The values close to zero are getting very narrow, fat bars. So if I want to go through and have the thin bars, um, <laughs> the fat bars close to one and the thin bars close to zero, I just need to flip those two again. So I'll just change the scaling here. I'll say it's going to go from one to five. Okay, let's run that and sort of see how that goes. Where did I put that about? So our new improved scheme, hopefully with a lot of red in this corner and fat bars in this corner. you're working, just as sort of a general way of thinking about kind of your work process, a very good thing to do is, at the beginning of time, as I'm just starting to debug, having a whole bunch of panels, having a thousand panels out there, could really slow you down. 
So it's okay as you're just trying to debug it and figure out the logic, go for two panels by three panels. It'll be kind of ugly, it won't be very smooth, but you'll at least get the logic down. Because it turns out it really makes a big difference. And if you have something that's 100 panels by 100 panels, like you could be waiting five minutes every time, okay? So, yeah, the scaling, that's, that happens automatically. Just get the logic down right. Okay, beautiful. I got these panels. They're not actually looking too bad. That's actually kind of groovy looking. Okay, but let's give it a slight variation before we head off on our break, or you can do it at the break if you want to. If you want to try to do something a little bit different, this is this rectangular aperture panel. Try changing to the rectangular panel with opening, and then scale it anywhere from, you don't want the opening to be zero, because zero would be, well, it's not gonna work. It has to be like, say, 0.05 to 0.45. That's your range of values. So see if you can kind of scale that. So I'd say 0.05 to 0.45 is kind of a good range of values for that one. So what you got to do is I'm going to come back over here. Let's see if I do have my rectangular panel with the aperture or with opening. I think I do, but if not, let's see if I have it or not. Pa All right, there it is. Panel with a sizable opening. That's the one I'm going to go for. Let's even, just so you get a sense of what it's like, Again, don't be afraid to try it out in uh, like a uh, Revit first because Dynamo really just automates Revit. If it doesn't work in Revit, it's not going to work in Dynamo, typically. So I'll choose one of those just to sort of understand its behavior. I'll say, let's go ahead and change you from the aperture panel to, well, let's try just making you that panel with a resizable opening. So the opening parameter, let's see if I can find it. There it is right down there. This is an opening right now of 0.19, so 0.2 essentially. Let's go ahead and try that. If I make the opening, let's try 0.05. You'll see it's a very large opening. If I make it 0.45, it'll be a very small opening. Okay, so. That panel and that range of values, try tweaking that around and sort of seeing if you can find count with something you like. So I'll come back over here. So is it just named opening, the parameter name is opening? Yeah. yeah, it's just opening. Okay, and again, that's just sort of something that came with the design of the panel. We could go through and change that just by uh, editing the panel. So to make that work, I'll have to go through and, oh, back over here in the family types. So I'll just change that over here to, where is it? Resizable opening right there. And then back over here, I'm going to not have wall thickness. I'll have opening. But now i got to work on the scaling. So the scaling I want to either be, if it's on the small side, let's say 0 0.05. Say 0.45. You were able to edit the opening of one channel, right? I changed one just to sort of test it. Say it one more time. It has to have like 0.05 and 0.45. That is a very interesting finding. I believe that's true because, boy, it certainly doesn't like it if it doesn't. Yeah. Check that out. <laughs> it's like it's like it's interpreting the dot as being part of it's like programming language where the dot is you know, part of the predicate versus the okay. Interesting. Who knew? Okay, so let's go ahead, break for five, come on back, and if you can, we will come on back and like do a little uh, playing around with that sun vector with a couple of kind of simple examples. Yes? Is there any way to feed a pair of multiple 
the parameters that you want to edit and multiple values of lists. Yes. It doesn't seem to accept it straight up as like list and list. Um, no, because we actually have to do it as two separate parameter by name. It has to change, you know, it'll, if you feed it the same list of elements and, you know, this function over here can actually return pairs of values. Mm -hmm. Then we'll say get the first item of each pair and feed it into the value to the first element set parameter by name. Right. Get the second but one. But you need two set parameter by names. So yes. Like multiple ones that can take. Yeah. It, and and you, you can't like do a cross product or something okay. and get yeah. it to do that. That's what I thought. Okay. <laughs> exactly. Now then you can because then you can have a bunch of inputs. Yeah. yeah. For a list. Exactly. So in Python you could write just a much smarter set element parameter by name. <laughs> yes. Oh, it's um, quite possible. Yeah, I'm I, I, just going to work out of memory. Let's take a look at it. So you're saying for session nine, nine there's only one part open? Yeah. yeah. All right, let's see. Let's, if nothing else, let's fix that. Okay, let me.